Hello everyone, I am delighted and truly sincerely delighted to be here today since it was absolutely fundamental at the JNMG Congress to be able to talk about psychonutrition, the science, the influence of food and nutrients on mental health, stress, anxiety, depression, sleep disorders, attention disorders, cognitive decline. I am Guillaume Fond, I am a researcher in psychonutrition in Marseille. I have a doctorate in psychiatry in cellular and molecular biology. And what I am going to present to you today is the scientific data that support the influence of our diet and our physical activity on our mental health. So what we put on our plate directly influences our thoughts and our emotions. And we are going to look together at the most recent scientific data that support this revolution in mental health. So we are going to start with a little interaction. You will have a QR code to answer a few questions because I wanted to have your feedback on your vision of psychonutrition, if you are discovering it, if you know it and especially also on your practice since on social networks, I run an Instagram account and a YouTube channel where I talk about psychonutrition. I have a lot of feedback from people concerned by mental health who challenge me on the fact that often their doctor either does not know about psychonutrition and is curious about the subject or thinks that it is rather. And so I wanted to have a little bit I think there is a selection post because if you are here today, it is perhaps already that you are particularly interested in the question. So we will start with the first interaction. If everyone was able to scan the QR code, Everyone was able to scan the QR code, is that good? Yeah. Put the Q code back please. Top right, perfect. So the first question in my practice is I know the influence of diet and nutrients on mental health and I promote it to my patients. B. I don't promise this approach due to lack of time. C. Don't promise this approach due to lack of knowledge. And D. I don't promise this approach because I don't believe in it or I don't adhere to it. And them, none of these choices. Be honest, it's not to please me. We can look at the answers. Well yeah, it's not bad anyway. So we have a good distribution finally between I don't promise ah oh, there is a competition between the and the C between I know the influence and I promote it and I don't promise due to lack of knowledge. So that's why you are here today. Uh so for those who know it, it's probably also to have the latest news uh in the field. And so it's no surprise, I'm delighted that we are meeting today to discuss this. We'll take the next question. The gut-brain axis has been scientifically proven, little a or little b, is that science fiction? So, in fact, I'm asking you this question because in fact it's the answer. We're going to let you vote now. Okay, it's quick. We're going to look at the answers. Can we look at the answers? Yeah, great. Okay, great, that's great. I wouldn't have to make much effort to convince you. So in fact, we're 100%, uh, ticking yes today. On the other hand, it was the National Agency for Continuing Professional Development that told me last year that it was a theory that had not been scientifically proven. So I'm going to show you the scientific evidence for gut-brain access because it didn't catch on with the ANDPC, which is still the National Agency for Continuing Professional Development. So for me, it's really I think one of the reasons why psychonutrition is slowed down in its progression in practices. And we still had a question, question 3, according to the current mental health recommendations that were issued in 2022. So I think that the majority of you don't know them, but it's rather to see all your knowledge in fact precisely on these data. Small a, omega-3 are effective in the treatment of depression in addition to antidepressants small b there are several possible answers. Small b, zinc and vitamin D are effective in the treatment of depression in small c, magnesium and inositol effective in the treatment of depression. Well that's bravo huh, that's not bad. So well, I'll give you the right answers. Yeah, that's it was there and the b there was there was a trap magnesium and inositol. Although magnesium is very popular, magnesium is currently not recommended in the treatment of depression, 
especially due to a lack of data in fact and the little data we have is not really in favor while the magism has other interests, but not in the treatment of depression. According to the 2022 recommendations, I insist on the fact that these are the current recommendations and that it can evolve in the future with the data from randomized controlled trials. In 2023, a column was published in the world in June 2023, last year by young psychiatrists who wrote that they had not witnessed in their practice. They had not witnessed any major scientific advances in the last 20 years concerning treatments, the biological understanding of psychiatric illnesses. When I read that, I was really appalled. I thought that we had missed something in our discipline on the training of our young colleagues because I am going to show you now everything that has changed and for me it has completely changed my way of practicing psychiatry and approaching mental health. You have heard of the gut-brain axis above all a field that has been popularized among the population by the discrete charm of the intestine. A book that had been published in France in 2017 by a German researcher colleague and her sister. A very educational book, very well illustrated. And which explains that there was a popularization of the link between the intestine and the brain, the second brain in the general population which preceded the awareness of the medical profession. In fact, there have been a lot of situations where it was the patient who came to his doctor and said, have you heard about the gut-brain axis? What do you think about it? And do you think it could be involved in my disorders? Which could also have created a kind of tension in the population, a feeling, a form of incomprehension of not being heard in fact for certain people in particular who had a syndrome of the intestinal tract which is the paradigm of the dysfunction of the gut-brain axis that we will see now. The animal data have provided so when I talk about this on social networks, I often have a lot of people who say, I am against research in mice on mice on the kidney. Well, I don't have an ethical position with regard to that, but in any case the results exist and we have demonstrations that are really edifying. We can transfer diseases by transferring intestinal bacteria in animal models and in particular we can transfer obesity. That is to say we take a mouse that was born in sterile conditions, what we call a xenic mouse and we inject it with the microbiota of a human being who has obesity and the mouse becomes obese. And it's the same thing for depression. We have depression phenotypes. Of course, we can't ask the mouse if it has suicidal thoughts, but we can look at its social interactions, its way of eating, its anxiety, its ability to explore its environment, its sleep and all of these are in fact symptoms animal models of depression that we can transfer by a transfer of microbiota. And even more edifying, it can be transmitted to the offspring. In fact, if the mouse has the disorder after the injection of the microbiosis, the offspring is also impacted. Among the other results that were really upsetting, that we are seeing around the world, there was this study that showed that we could modify the behavior of a fly. Here, the Drosophila fly, more commonly called the fly. And that this fly, in fact, if we administered a genetic mutation that meant that it did not synthesize a particular amino acid, the microbiota, in fact, could direct the fly to choose, in piles of foods that were similar in smell, in appearance, in every way, it would specifically feed on the food that contained the amino acid that the intestinal bacteria were lacking. So that means that the bacteria in the intestine can influence their root and this has been shown in several animal models. And so of course the question is what happens in humans. In humans, the gut-brain access, it is well known now. We have increasingly given a lot to understand how this 1.5 kilograms packet of bacteria in our intestine is able to influence our brain. The first communication route which is the most obvious is the anatomical route, the vagus nerve. 80% of the information from this nerve goes from the intestine to the brain. We are constantly processing unconscious information in our brain that comes from our intestine. Then, there is the metabolism of tryptophan. You know as well as I do, tryptophan is the precursor of serotonin, a very important hormone in mental health since it is a hormone involved in depression, in anxiety, in eating disorders, in sleep disorders since it is also the precursor of melatonin, in impulsivity, in aggressiveness.
so it is really a neurotransmitter to which we are very attentive in mental health. And so the microbiota disorders will lead to a disorder of the absorption of this trip top and so there will not be the fuel necessary to synthesize serotonin in the brain. Short-chain fatty acids, such as butyrate, are very studied and, in particular in the mental health of the child, since during neurodevelopment, these short-chain fatty acids are very important for the fuel of the development of the central nervous system and there are many studies that have shown the links between microbiota disturbances and the troops of the autistic spectrum. One of the observations that is also edifying is that 95% of the neurotransmitters that are very well known in mental health such as dopamine, norepinephrine, serotonin, acetylene are in fact present in the lumen of our intestine. It is thought that from an evolutionary point of view, this comes from the fact that in the same way as mitochondria, the energy organs of our cells come from an archaeobacterium. In the same way, our central nervous system of karyota actually used the bacterial genes of our microbiota for the benefit of the development of its central nervous system. Which explains why we find the same neurotransmitters in the lumen of our intestine and in our brain. Then there is the capital influence and I will insist a lot on this of our microbiota on our immune system. Now we have known for 30 years that immunity is linked to mental health. If I am in good immune health, I am protected in terms of mental health. Protected does not mean invulnerable. I insist on this because often when I communicate with the general public, I immediately get a response of, I had a depression when I was in very good immune health. So that is not the question. The question is that it reduces the risk. It does not make you invulnerable. It is estimated that 40% of depressions are associated with immunological inflammation disorders. So that means that there are other depressions that come from other causes. For example, psychotrauma, burnout, etc. What is certain is that the more weakened I am on the immune system, the more I am not only at risk of upper respiratory infections such as a cold, COVID, but also at risk of stress, anxiety, sleep disorders, tension disorders that can lead to depression. And the loop is closed with the descending system because when I am stressed, I increase my cortisol, the stress hormone that can be measured in the sedative. This cortisol increases the permeability of my intestine. Normally, an intestine is impermeable, it must filter nutrients. The intestinal barrier must protect me from all infections in my food bowl. And when I am stressed repeatedly in fact, so acute and positive stress, it increases my vigilance in the face of danger. When I am it is chronic, a low-grade inflammation will set in. My immune system will constantly fight against aggressive agents and this will lead to what is called liquid gout, leaky gut syndrome. What are the aggressive agents? It is our modern life, it is the sedentary lifestyle, it is the lack of physical activity. It is stress, it is sleep deprivation, the reduction of exposure to screens, the reduction of sleep time by one hour for 50 years and above all it is our modern ultra-processed diet rich in fast sugar, saturated fats which will weaken the biodiversity of our microbiota. One in four people who are in good health, who do not have any health problems, have a rare qualitative or quantitative reflection of their intestinal microbiota. This is the most recent data. Which means that our modern lifestyle has disconnected us from our environment and that this results in a collapse of the biodiversity of the bacteria in our intestine in the same way that we are witnessing the collapse of the biodiversity of our environment. So there are many researchers in France who are working on these questions of the links in animal models between the troops of the microbiota and mental health and who, on models for example of animal depression that does not respond to antidepressants who, show that the administration of bacteria, therefore probiotics, can correct depression in animals, with in particular an activation of the endocannabinoid system, which is a system in the brain that is currently being studied a lot in mental health. So we are moving away from the synapse and serotonin to explore other cascades since you know as well as I do. One in two people who have depression today in France do not respond correctly to antidepressants and these antidepressants have side effects, sexual side effects. 
Within 28 days of prescription, there is an increase in the risk of suicide and within 28 days of stopping the antidepressant, there is persistent anhedonia. There is weight gain and metabolic syndromes too. So there are still many disadvantages to antidepressants. Be careful, I insist. I am not against prescribing antidepressants, I teach psychopharmacology. My point is to actually think about the causes of depression and to target the indications for both psychonutrition and antidepressant prescription. So, what do we know today? We will go straight to the conclusion. I will spoil everything for you right away. What do we know about the best diet for mental health? The data comes from observational meta-analysis, so it is very difficult to do randomized controlled trials. They exist but they are few in number because in fact there is no placebo group. People know what they eat. So and then there is the question of compliance. Even if you put someone in a study protocol and well in practice after three months they will not have done what you expect in terms of diet, and that is the reality of practice. It is not enough to tell people what to eat of course for it to be followed by effectiveness and change. And we will come back to it. That is why it is a question that is asked. It is how do you do when you have someone who lacks motivation, who lacks energy to up bring them to change. And that was the subject in fact of a book that I had written called, I make my life a big project because that was the common point of all the patients who came to see me. It is, I want to change sustainably and I can't do it. And there are scientific techniques in fact to effectively support in fact in a sustainable change. Concerning food, what we know so it is that the best diet for the protection of mental health is the Mediterranean type diet, that is to say mainly plant-based, which does not mean vegetarian. It just means that the majority of the diet comes from fruits, vegetables and legumes. So we must reverse our current pyramid. In the current diet of the French, there is three times too much meat, 1.6 kilograms of meat per week. The data from 2021 when we should have 500 grams per week. Too much salt. On on salt is one of the leading causes of mortality linked to diet in France and in the world. And not enough plants, not enough vegetables and fruits which will provide fibers which will nourish our microbiota. So there, we have one of the explanations for the collapse of biodiversity and also of our microbiota, it is the reduction in the consumption of fruits and vegetables. So there, what I often hear from the community is yes, but if it is to eat fruits and vegetables full of pesticides, it is not great either. Indeed, there is also a subject on the nature of foods and the price of foods. Concerning the price, I actually remind you that a diet that is good for mental health often costs less than a diet of the type we call Western. This is the scientific name for our majority diet in France and in the Western world. It is because we have produced better in Western modernity. And therefore this diet rich in ultra-processed products. So, in fast sugar, in saturated fat, in food additives, in sweeteners too, all this will disrupt our microbiota and, in cascade, our mental health increase our vulnerability to stress, to sleep disorders, to tension, which can then lead to disorders such as anxiety and depressive disorders. So, the Mediterranean diet which is anti-inflammatory reduces the risk of depression by 33%. This is considerable and conversely the Western diet increases it by 33%. So the fact of moving from a Western diet to a Mediterranean type diet in fact really has consequences both in preventive since it has been shown in prospective studies therefore on large meta-analyses. The first meta-analysis in fact which showed its results was published in 2018 in Molecular Salcadric. It was a team from Montpelier, it was a French team and it was then replicated by other teams around the world who tried to look more precisely at which foods were actually most involved in protection against the risk of depression. And so the answer in fact is in 2021 in this meta-analysis by Madison and colleagues which shows that eating fruit every day reduces the risk of depression by 15%. Eating vegetables every day reduces the risk of depression by 9%. Regarding the price, inflation has actually increased the prices of meat and fish much more than the rest of the foods. All foods have increased. So it costs more to eat. Anyway and on the other hand meat has increased by 30% while the average basket has increased by 15%. So that's for the answer on its expensive doctor to eat well. And then we're also going to look at the question of supplementation which is a very important question. 
I was really impacted by this study that was published last year in the fall. In fact, an English study on an English biobank. So, a biobank of hundreds of thousands of English people who had given a blood sample and who had filled out questionnaires on their lifestyle and their mental health. So, we had genetic data, lifestyle data, and data on their state of anxiety and depression. The answer from this study is that diet is effective in reducing depression. Including in people at high genetic risk of depression, and the effect is about 40%, so in the variance. So it's really considerable. So that's really a message of hope. And so the whole challenge for us in our practices is not to feel guilty while at the same time making people responsible. So that's what's a bit complicated is that at the same time, we have to give the message of hope that we can act, we can do something every day in our shopping cart, and at the same time, not blame people who can't do it. Who can't change their eating behavior. And for that, one of the most effective ways is to insist on what we can increase rather than what we have to remove. So, typically, instead of talking about stopping the chocolate bar, increase the fruits and vegetables and take small steps and celebrate the changes. But is eating well enough to be in good mental health? And there is a debate, it's not consensual, but here, I present to you the scientific data which are very established. There are doctors in the public domain who speak out, especially general practitioners and ah、uh, who say, Omega 3s are useless, you have to eat sardines. This is something that is asked of me a lot by the community. What do you think of this doctor who took a position and who says that? And so it is quite recent and it is also taken up by sardine manufacturers. And ah,、uh, what is great is that in this regard, I have been criticized for being pro antidepressant when I present data on antidepressants, for being anti antidepressant when I present data on psychonutrition, and a、uh, here is for being pro food when I present the data that I am going to present to you now. So, well, a、uh, so to tell you that finally, finally, I only look at the studies and I simply ask you to look at the studies, not me, I do not present my opinion. In fact, I present studies to you and they are there. There are 80%. That's when I looked at the epidemiology studies on the surface of the planet. I knew the figures for vitamin D deficiencies because ANSES, the National Authority for Food Safety, published a report in 2012, a second one in 2021. So we know very precisely the figures for vitamin D and n e s s o r a g e deficiencies. 100% of French people do not have sufficient dietary intake of vitamin D, and the sun is not enough to compensate for these deficiencies since you have to be exposed for more than 20 minutes on a significant part of the body, that is to say, really the torso and not the forearms, uh, during and on a, under a summer sun because it is really the exposure to UVIs, therefore tanning, which synthesizes vitamin D. So if we put on total sunscreen, it doesn't work either, in fact. So for all these reasons, in fact, Uh, vitamin D deficiency is the most common of all deficiencies, and that's on the ANC. It's documented, it's official. Well, everyone agrees. Despite that, there was a position taken、uh, by a group of general practitioners saying that in most cases, vitamin D was useless, which is not true. In fact, I'm going to present the mental health data to you, and I think that one of the reasons for this misunderstanding is precisely that we forget mental health in general medical health, in fact. And so that, I think that it's really, I actually spoke about it with a general practitioner who works at the ONA, the National Observatory of Plant Based Food, and who told me, Guillaume, indeed, I confirm, I wrote a report on vitamin D, and I didn't think about mental health. In fact, we think about osteoporosis, we think about other things, about immunity, but not about the brain and mental health. So I asked myself the question, what are the data concerning omega 3? Because in fact, we will see, omega 3 has proven, has the highest level of scientific proof of effectiveness in the treatment of depression. And so, I wanted to know what is the state of the population, the nutritional state of the population concerning omega 3. And so, I found this international data. As you can see, it is cardiology data because, in fact, cardiologists are very interested in omega 3, and we can measure it in erythrocytes, red blood cells. On the other hand, we cannot measure it in the brain directly. So, we are obliged to make extrapolations. So, we know what is happening. It is estimated that the omega 3 index, the 3 eye water that we measure in red blood cells, is a good approximation marker of the body's overall stock. But in practice, we have to go to animal models to understand exactly what is happening in the brain. I will come back to this. And omega 3, in fact, 
there is a particular omega-3 which is DHA, docosahexanoic acid which represents 50% of the lipids in our neurons. The brain is the fattiest organ in the body after adipose tissue, after fat. And one of the explanations in fact for the mental health problems that we are seeing because there has been an explosion, especially since COVID, especially among young people and what is fascinating is to see that our president of the republic spoke of a plan for physical activity, which is very good, because we are going to talk about physical activity later. And when we talk about food, we must always talk about physical activity, since the two must be mirrored, caloric intake and caloric expenditure. On the other hand, there was not a single sentence on food. And that was already the problem in the United States with Michelle Obama who had made a plan for the prevention of obesity in children because the two Obama daughters had problems with being overweight and, in fact, finally, it was only the physical activity part that broke through because the industrial lobbies were very strongly opposed to the part on prevention through food and I think it is no coincidence that we have a sports minister who poses with Coca-Cola saying thank you Coca for the Olympics ah and that we do not hear about psychonutrition either. I think, for these reasons. There, the figures are very clear in fact. The more you are in the red, the more you are deficient in omega-3. So, these are epidemiological studies, people randomly selected from electoral lists, for example, who are therefore measured with a representation of the entire population, men, women, of all ages, children, adolescents, elderly people, and we actually look at their omega-3 status. And so here are the international figures when the countries have not been tested. In fact, we don't have data for these countries. So you see that France is just before the United States and Canada which have the worst figures in terms of omega-3 deficiency and in fact these are average figures. So what saves, in quotes, a little bit? What makes us in the orange is probably in fact the consumption of oily fish on the bed in France. And the countries you see like me in fact, the countries that are in green, are the countries in fact that have a lot of consumption of oily fish and in particular also algae because the DHA that we find in the flesh of oily fish in fact, it comes basically from the plankton eaten by small fish. And so my point is that saying we have to eat fish to have omega-3 does not work from a global health point of view. Why? The fish that are mainly in our diet are farmed fish. Now, you see the evolution of fish stocks since the 80s plus half of the fish consumed today are farmed fish. There has been a radical change and that is also the real problem is that our Ministry of Health is still cut off from the Ministry of Agriculture. As long as we do not manage to bring these two ministries together, we will not be able to solve the problem of psychonutrition in France and in the world. Farmed fish is actually something that is not at all known, that is published but that is not known. It is that they were previously fed. In fact, the most successful fish are salmon and tuna. They said you have to eat salmon and tuna because it is rich in omega-3. It is not true, it is not rich in omega-3, it is not the richest in omega-3 because there is trophic loss of DHA as the fish cycle progresses. So if you want the best DHA rate, you have to go for small oily fish, that is to say macro sardines. So you have to like them already. The good news is that canned fish preserve omega-3 but frozen fish do not. After 6 months of freezing, there is more omega-3 in fish. So patients can tell you, I eat fish 3 times a week. If it's frozen salmon, it's over, there's no omega-3 in salmon. Quote. So you have to be really specific. That's why dietary surveys have their limits and that's why I presented you with the data from blood tests directly from erythrocytes which conclude that more than 80% of the world's population is deficient in DHA. Why? Because DHA is not found in plant-based omega-3s. The other thing I talked about it with my daughter's pediatrician who told me, I recommend that my patients' parents diversify their oils and take walnut, rapeseed, and olive oil. Uh, and I thought it was okay for DHA because in fact DHA, we need it enormously in the first two years of life because there is a neuronal explosion in fact, the development of the brain in postnatal, so pregnancy and the first two years of life are really the time of life when there is the highest demand from the brain for DHA and I am really amazed that the problem is not at all addressed in fact from a public health point of view to ensure in fact that all children, 
All fetuses and all infants do not have that we do not ensure in fact that they have a sufficient intake of DHA. If there is breastfeeding, it is absolutely necessary to ensure that the breastfeeding mother in fact has sufficient intake of omega-3 and I think that is very often not done and not known. There are oils for children that contain DHA, but on the other hand, if you consume walnut and rapeseed oil, in fact the only omega-3 that you will have in it is ALA. And this ALA is converted up to 20% into EPA. Another very important omega-3 in mental health that we will review, but less than 1% into DHA. So that means that you cannot have the DHA. Necessary. And so if you are vegetarian or vegan, it is not possible to have sufficient intakes in food. And even among fish eaters, studies have shown that eating fish three times a week does not allow you to reach, these were American studies, does not allow you to reach sufficient levels of OMEGA3. You have seen the figures in the United States as I have. And so in practice, if we said we should recommend that everyone eat fish at least three times a week, we would be seven times short of the current stock of fish to feed humanity in fact. So it's a message that is irresponsible from the point of view of both the environment and just reality in fact. So it's not me who says it, EH, that's it, it's this published data. Well, I discovered this data during the work I did on psychonutrition. I didn't know it, I had never heard it. It dates from 2017 anyway so it's not particularly recent. And so in fact, what is the only solution at the global level to address this DHA deficiency which is the most hidden of all deficiencies? We talk a lot about iron deficiencies, for example, never about DHA deficiencies. We can't measure omega-3 in the blood even though it's actually a dextro. Uh, you only need a drop of blood to know your omega-3 index. It's not available in hospitals and in France in laboratories. I asked the PHM, we don't do it. Why? I don't know. And so, we have the data on the food surveys which show that even for Al, so this plant-based omega-3 which is recommended, which is included in the recommendations of the PNS, the National Health Program, the ALA intake, while 98% of French people don't reach them. So, even outside of fish, with rapeseed oils, nuts, walnut oil, then the consumption of flax seeds, chia seeds which can be rich in omega-3, while 98% of people don't reach them. So that's the reality in fact of the food situation of the French today. And what exposes them in fact means that their brain, our brains are malnourished. And a malnourished brain is like going out in a t-shirt in winter. We are exposed to stress, anxiety, sleep disorders, depression and women more than men. We know that there is two to three times more depression in women. Why? Because there is the question of hormonal cycles. And so, there is premenstrual syndrome for example which is the illustration of that. So in the week or weeks preceding the period of the appearance of psychological disorders, irritability, sleep disorders, tension disorders, all linked in fact to fluctuations in hormones. Estrogens and progesterone influence, there are receptors in the brain that will influence mental health. The perimenopause period which is an experience of period at risk of chronic inflammation which will consume in fact, we will see it when I am in a state of inflammation in the blood, my brain is in a state of neuroinflammation. The brain, in fact, we have the mistake that we made, is to think that the brain was in a you are, blood in fact that it was enveloped by the blood-brain barrier and that it was completely disconnected from everything that was happening in the rest of the body and which was just taking its glucose, a few nutrients that were working on its own. That was a huge mistake. In fact in a state of inflammation, we saw that the intestine could become permeable but the blood-brain barrier can also become permeable in a state of inflammation. There is a complex called the inflammome which will be activated with interlines like interline 1 for example. I won't go into details. And that will create cascades in the brain that will lead to a decrease in neurotransmission, therefore a functional decrease in neurotransmitters. And my point is to say before prescribing an antidepressant, therefore a serotonin reuptake inhibitor in the synapse for example, is it not more effective and more logical to start by renourish the brain and eliminate the inflammatory conditions that led to this situation? So uh for me, prescribing an antidepressant for inflammatory depression is like putting paracetamol on an infection. It temporarily relieves certain symptoms, but it does not solve the real cause of the problem. 
For vitamin D, the figures are extremely clear. An average intake in fact for all women in fact in the diet, it is 3 microg per day. For men, it is 5 microg per day. Despite fortified foods, so all dairy products enriched with vitamin D, we should reach 15 micrograms per day. This is the nutritional reference for the population, so we are extremely far from the mark. And so that's what I was telling you, the majority, the vast majority of French people do not have sufficient vitamin D intake in their diet. So pediatricians recommend vitamin D supplementation throughout childhood and adolescence. And my point is that in fact we should not stop in fact and that we must also get out of the logic of the cure. We must not wait to be sick. In winter to have a cold to start a supplementation but rather to make sure because the brain does not store. That is really a point that I too took a long time to realize in fact. We do not have the brain does not store in fact. So there are studies showing that after stopping DHA supplementation, within 28 days of stopping supplementation, the brain's DHA level decreases with animal models. So we actually need essential nutrients every day for our brain to function and these nutrients are imported less and less through food. You may have seen the investigative cache of France 2 last week on tomatoes grown above ground which contained 70% fewer nutrients compared to tomatoes grown in soil and that agro-industrialists are not at all interested in the nutrient content of their food. What interests them is the taste and the price. And that the only thing that could perhaps change things is that we are. There are studies that are underway to show that taste is correlated with nutrient content and that, for example, the taste of a tomato depends on the nutrient content of that tomato. The article that was a game changer for mental health is really this article and recommendation from 2022 from the World Federation of Biological Psychiatry, the WFSBP in association with CANMAT, the Canadian Association for Anxiety Disorders, two very important international associations in mental health. So I insist, here it is, I am not presenting my work. My opinion, I am in fact presenting the recommendations, the practical guides for international mental health. So 31 experts from 15 countries with representation from the West and the East, which actually explains why we have such original results in fact, I will come back to it and that in the West, in fact we have many more pharmacology studies and many psychonutrition studies. In fact, psychonutrition, although we have studies that have been conducted in the United States, in England, oh, almost not in France unfortunately, it is Australia in fact that has been innovative in fact on the data on the links between diet and mental health. And we have a lot of studies in the Middle East and Asia. But all these studies have been synthesized in meta-analyses with the analysis of the levels of risk of bias and so on, so everything is sort of wrapped up. Then, we have the recommendations that were this time conducted by France and the Network of Expert Centers for Schizophrenia. So, it is not limited to questions of anxiety, depression. There are also recommendations for psychonutrition for other severe mental disorders. And then a review also for bipolar mood disorder. So, I will not present that to you today. I will be happy to answer your questions, but I really focused on the most common. That is to say depression and it is also the pathology where we have the most data. The data, I have summarized them for you here, it is the current data. They may need to evolve for some of the nutrients, but in any case, that's what we know today. Uh, in the state of scientific knowledge, omega-3s have the highest level of proof of effectiveness in the treatment of depression and what we know is that they are even more effective when added to antidepressants. Why? Because in fact, we now think that psychotropic drugs, particularly antidepressants, antiepileptic drugs and antipsychotics, modify lipid metabolism. And I explained to you that the brain consumes a lot of lipids, needs a lot of lipids and polyunsaturated fats, whereas in fact our diet is too rich in saturated fats. So saturated fats are okay when we use them for caloric purposes for physical activity. For example, they are fuel. On the other hand, excess saturated fat will clog up all our organs including our arteries and also our brain which is vascularized, and that will create chronic inflammation. This is one of the explanations why omega-3s and this time in particular it is PA in fact which has proven its effectiveness at a dose of more than 1 gram per day. 
These are fairly high doses and often the question that comes to mind right away is are there hemorrhagic and cardiovascular risks? So concerning the risk of atrial fibrillation because I had proposed to the PHM and omega-3 supplementation for all hospitalized patients because in fact when you are hospitalized by definition you belong to a population at risk. In fact, what led to the hospital? Other causes and the conditions which led to the hospital often mean finally most of the time. Finally unless you were just hit by a car and even then we could imagine links are also with the same mental health. The whole thing that leads to the hospital is actually, uh, probably linked to a lifestyle. And what a nutrition professor had told me was the risk of atrial fibrillation. So I wondered what the hell is this? So I went to look at the studies. The risk of atrial vibration occurs from 4 grams per day of OMEGA3. So we are very far from the mark. The doses I am talking about are 1 gram per day of PA and 400 milligrams per day of DHA. This is currently what is recommended in the treatment of depression. And for maintenance doses, this is what ANCES says, these are official recommendations. It is 250 mg of DHA and 250 mg of PA. At these doses, there is no risk of hemorrhage or atrial fibrillation that has been reported. There was a study that studied 1.8 grams of omega-3 per day, so DHA and EPA. And there, the small p was at 00.6, so close when there was a significant trend. So there was an article that was published in Prescrie that says that you should not exceed 1 gram of PA per day. I don't agree with that. I actually think that between 1 gram and 1.5 grams we are still in a safe zone but we don't have the studies to decide and that it really needs to be a doctor who assesses the benefit and risk with the patient for the dose. But on the other hand, Everyone can benefit from omega-3 supplementation. It's all a question of doses in fact since everyone is deficient in DHA. One of the solutions for DHA because in fact it is true that I brought up the problem but there is also a solution would be that we industrially produce large quantities of DHA from algae. Algae are not plants in fact. They are therefore a separate living being body which synthesizes DHA and then this DHA is eaten by small fish which are eaten by large fish, which are eaten by human beings. So, instead of going through the entire chain, which in passing will enrich us with heavy metals, cadmium, methyl mercury, wouldn't we do better directly and for the environment, because planetary health is linked to human health and mental health, to go directly to the origin, that is to say to the algae? And it's possible, it already exists, there are already supplements based on algae oil. Most of them are in capsules and that's where there is a conceptual problem around the food supplement. So, it took me a long time and in fact, I found the answer two days ago to know why there were so many finally. There was a body, a part of the health professionals who opposed food supplements. So I haven't followed the whole story of food supplements, but I know that in the 2000s there were abuses in the allegations, there were lots of subjects. Uh, I think that vitamin D is an excellent example of, of this question because, uh, one of my interns who had been, therefore, trained in psychonutrition in my department went to geriatrics then and the geriatricians told him, vitamin D is a pharmaceutical lobby to sell ampules, it's useless. So when I heard that, I was wow, especially in older people even more so. So vitamin D is actually a steroid hormone. You see here so it has proven its effectiveness in mental health. It was the 2022 recommendations, it has evolved since then. The level of evidence for vitamin D has increased because we have an umbrella meta-analysis in fact. So it is a collection of meta-analysis that confirmed the effectiveness of vitamin D supplementation. And so this styrofoam hormone will actually modulate our immune system and so in fact it will also modify epigenetics. And what is incredible in fact is that in this list of nutrients that I present to you, so those that have proven their effectiveness, omega-3, including in bipolar depression, probiotics, zinc, methyl folate, be careful, methyl folate, it is the active form of vitamin B9 and it is the one that is recommended in mental health, not the folic acid that you can prescribe, the derfolines, nor the special folene folinic acid that you can prescribe. That is another subject, it is how is it? That we doctors in France, we can prescribe folic acid and folinic acid and not methylfolate which is the active form of vitamin B9.
We can prescribe dehydrogel which is the active form of vitamin D but we cannot prescribe the active form of vitamin B9. Why? I have no answer. Methyl folate is actually a form of vitamin B9 that will be absorbed at the brain level. While 30% of people have an all a variant of a gene of MTHFR, it is methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase, an enzyme that converts folinic acid into methyl folate, and they will have a deficient enzyme. What happens if you give folic acid to someone who has this MTHFR mutation? Folic acid will be stored in the blood. What I was taught in medical school was that there was no problem with water-soluble vitamins because we were going to piss out the excess of water-soluble vitamin B, for example. However, there have been case reports of folic acid accumulation in the blood in people who did not have this ability to convert it into folic acid. And so in mental health. This is the explanation why the trials against randomized with folic acids are negative while the trials with methyl palate are positive. So it is really the form of vitamin B9 that must be administered. Vitamin B9 is found in leafy vegetables, for example spinach. On the other hand, it is destroyed by cooking too much or for too long. So if you make gratins for example, there is more vitamin B9. So in fact, uh, it is really in fact questions. Finally really the current situation is that there are a lot of people who do not eat vegetables and that vitamin B9 in fact, there are deficiencies. So, there are 6% of people in France who have vitamin B9 deficiencies measured in the blood, but it does not say how much vitamin B is lacking in their brain because of this problem of conversion and absorption. It is really a functional deficiency. You can have a normal level and a functional deficiency in the brain in methylpalate. It's the same subject for tryptophan and serotonin. One of the absolutely major discoveries is that when I am in a condition of inflammation, my tryptophan will be diverted, short-circuited towards an inflammatory pathway in my brain and it will not be used for the synthesis of C so consequently the level of serotonin will drop. So in fact we will put an antidepressant to raise the level of serotonin. While the real cause of the problem is the fact that tryptophan is diverted towards an inflammatory pathway and this inflammatory pathway comes from an inflammatory diet therefore rich in ultra-formed product which will make our microbiota everything that I have presented to you. So if we leave the diet in place and that's what I understood two days ago finally better late than never it is in fact it is an Australian dietitian. There was an international psychonutrition seminar last Tuesday here in Paris that answered me when I said, but why don't you talk about the data on the effectiveness of supplementation? Because in fact, we tell people that you have to eat well, do physical activity, it's complicated, while well, it's not easy to put all that in place. And you don't talk about supplementation, she says, yes, you're right, it would have taken me one hour and finally the classic answer. But above all she said to me, and I don't want to give the illusion to the patient that he can continue his lifestyle as before in fact because he takes his capsules that he can continue to eat burgers. And I, and I said to myself, but there you go, that's it in fact, the thing is, but for me, it's counterproductive in fact, it's not one or the other, it's both together in fact. We have to change our plate, our diet, watch our physical activity, it's essential. There is no miracle pill that will replace a good diet and physical activity. And at the same time, we have seen that a good diet and physical activity are not enough to nourish our brains in fact with omega-3 and DHA, in vitamin D in particular. Uh, so why deprive ourselves of this supplementation, especially when we are faced with someone who has mental health problems, stress, anxiety, depression. There you go. So we can prescribe zinc, we can prescribe vitamin D, it's reimbursed. So that's already a very good thing. The problem with the APISC for zinc, so the doses that have proven effective in zinc, are quite high doses in fact around 25 milligrams. We don't have 25 milligrams, we have 15 and 30 with the APISC. And in fact, my point is that the methanesis, we go up so, there are plenty of studies outside of mental health for zinc because zinc, it stimulates the pancreas in fact and therefore the regulation of glucose. So, there are a lot of studies in the context of prediabetes, diabetes, insulin resistance and we are very interested in mental health because there are direct links between disturbances in carbohydrate metabolism and mental health, sleep disorders, tension, stress, anxiety. And so these data in fact for the pancreas are very clear, it is that it is dangerous to overprescribe, to overdose zinc. We must be careful about that.
There are average dietary intakes of the French which have been which are available on the ANCES website, on the SACAL too. And also the figures are very clear. In fact, for the ideal supplementation for women, it would be 10 mg per day and for men 5 mg per day because men have more zinc intake in their diet, in particular because they consume more products of animal origin. And there are stories of absorption too. That is to say that if I consume legumes, so I told you uh about legumes, so chickpeas, lentils, all that for vegetable proteins, in fact the 2022 recommendations from Montpelier. Uh so it's an article directed by Florent Vier whom I contacted after and who told me, Guillaume, I didn't put omega-3 in the calculations because it's impossible to reach the AIMS omega-3 objectives, so 250 mg of DHA and 250 mg of PA. If we say that we should only eat one portion of oily fish per week, it's impossible to reach. And even with the three portions, we saw that it was impossible to reach in fact. So uh so there is a problem with the equation in fact. Uh so that's why in fact I insist on this. Uh we have to look in fact at the diet we put on our plate. We have to reduce ultra processed products which will harm our microbiota and worsen our mental health. I include sodas in it which are the worst catastrophe whether they are sweetened or sweetened in fact that we were invented for humanity. Because in fact we did the food study on diet, physical activity and mental health between 2021 and 2023. I am currently analyzing the first results. The results, we made 6 groups, men, women, 3 age groups, 18 to 34 years old, 35 years old, over 55 years old. The result is that among 18 to 34 year olds, in both sexes, the consumption of ultra processed products and sodas independently increases the risk of depression. It is very very clear and adjusted of course for all the confounding factors that you can imagine, the brightness, the time of year, being unemployed, being married, having children, we took everything, that's it. Everything we could imagine and it persists. There you go, the association resists the adjustment and on the other hand from the age of 35, the association only persists in women and in fact we don't yet understand why. And so, among the hypotheses, it is the hormonal issues that I am talking about, perimenopause, premenstrual syndrome, in fact, fluctuations, the syndrome of political works. Finally, there are many things uh, that can explain in fact that women are even more vulnerable to the question of psychonutrition, which can also explain that 85% of the people who come to me are women because generally speaking women are more interested in their health and more in nutrition. So it is a subject in fact for which women's health in fact and also has an even more particular place. As I said, the recommendations are not limited to depression. We also have supplements that have proven effective in other psychiatric disorders. I will quickly go over this because you are less concerned in general medicine, it was just so that you have actually heard this data once. NaCini, an amino acid that is an antioxidant precursor of glutathione, has shown efficacy in both obsessive compulsive disorders and in schizophrenia, the part of negative symptoms, autistic withdrawal. So, I insist on this, for example in schizophrenia, when we say that something is effective, we really have to look at what it is and we are really moving up a level in precision. We are moving away from overall efficacy to really go more precisely. Are we talking about delusions and all-out hallucinations, or are we talking about withdrawal, lack of energy and motivation, which is a huge problem in mental health? We have efficacy data for nasheen, methylfolate, and omega-3s. For omega-3s, it is more about anxiety and depression problems. So, that means that it actually works transnosographically, since we also have efficacy data in borderline mood disorder, which is an emotional disorder of emotional regulation that affects many people in mental health and also in general medicine, I think. We have some data for DHD. This is a question that I am asked a lot in fact about DHD in children, but it is data that has levels of proof that are still quite low because it is much more complicated to do research in psychonutrition in children than in adults. And so we still have a lot of scientific data to look for. So the limits in fact for the development, the deployment in fact of this psychonutrition, is that there are many brands of food supplements that it is complicated to find your way around, that it is expensive, it is not reimbursed. So another question, why is it not reimbursed? Because I am 100% in favor of reimbursing what has scientifically proven its effectiveness. So I agree to delist what has not been proven. Omega-3, we saw internal recommendation 2022, effectiveness in depression plus plus maximum level of proof, no reimbursement. So that is a real obstacle to dissemination in practice because there are many people in the population who think that if it is not reimbursed it is not effective. So that is a real issue.
problem of compliance because when you have to take four different brands at different dosages every morning that represents 10 to 15 capsules uh you have to think about it so there are a lot of questions uh the question of certain multivitamins of which certain nutrients are overdosed i talked about zinc for example in fact there are many supplements that are too high in zinc so suddenly it can be dangerous there have been studies published on the risk of increased diabetes in fact with precisely at the level of the pancreas uh what we call kerbanja, that is to say in fact the insufficiency induces disorders but the excess also induces many disorders and sometimes exponentially. Generally speaking, everything that is metal in fact, magnesium, zinc, iron, you have to be very careful about overdosing in fact because there it can have really adverse consequences. Selenium too for example. So selenium has shown interesting data in cognitive decline for example, but you have to be very careful not to be in excess. So in fact, there is the question of dosage too. The CPM is very clear. You should not dose vitamin D. You can supplement directly because the upper safety limit is 100 microg per day. So six times more than the recommended per ort. So we really have room to be underage because I am told, ah yes, the risk of calcic nephritis. I looked at the literature. It is in people who have chronic renal failure. So it is not the majority of our patients. And then it is in infants in fact with mothers who made unit errors between oils and micrograms in fact who gave huge doses of vitamin D to their infant. So in fact the risk of supplementing its dosage is non-existent in fact. I have in 15 years, I have never seen a situation of a person who has had an adverse effect on a vitamin D supplement when we simply respect the recommended doses on the supplements. After the question that is asked of me, is it that the ampules are as effective as the drops or the tablets? There is a metanese that suggests that it is slightly more effective a supplement that. I insist on the fact that the methanizes are averages, so in fact you take 100 people and you do an average. That doesn't mean that for the patient you have in front of you, it won't be finally if the ampule is not enough to be effective and and that you do a dosage and that you actually find that the dosage is finally that the vitamin D level remains done because there are absorption problems especially with overweight. You also have to adapt the dose of the nutrient to the weight of the patient. Finally that people who have a higher weight need higher doses. This is also valid for omega-3. So it's quite precise. This is one of the reasons why psychonutrition is complicated and that it's more difficult than simply prescribing oxetine 20 mg per day. And so all of this must be taken into account and is a potential obstacle to the spread of psychonutrition. So in fact parentheses in fact because I was presenting this data. I have if you want to have a tool for disseminating everything I have presented to you for patients, in particular those concerned, relatives who want to know more. That's why I wrote, eat well, so as not to get depressed anymore, in fact, so that it is really accessible to everyone with the scientific evidence. So there are the 250 references of the meta-analyses, observational data, uh, to really have a tool for disseminating knowledge for both those concerned and health professionals. So that's why I put two levels of reading, in fact, popularized and specific, in fact, with the data from randomized controlled trials, so that there is no debate of opinion. In fact, my point is, when people ask me on social networks what do you think of what Dr. So and so said, I say, I answer on the studies, not on the opinions because otherwise we find everything, he on in the opinions, including in the medical profession in fact. So there you go, my point is really to go to the studies. You also have a free ebook, I really wanted that has no barrier in fact to the break of the diffusion, so which is downloadable on the internet for free in fact where I make a synthesis a really very synthetic in fact of the data on the diet, the physical activity, the mental health. I will present to you very quickly after the physical activity because I am too talkative and so that allows me to create a community of people engaged around psychonutrition also. And then therefore, I broadcast on the social networks, so in particular Instagram and YouTube, the data, the news on the meta-analyses which have been published. Would I discover myself because really it is a field which is extremely dynamic. Hey every month, there are new meta-analyses on nutrients, of the effectiveness. There, I communicated on the TN recently for example which has an extremely interesting amino acid. And so for the question of what can we actually do in practice, I also actually work to determine a formula that brings together the nutrients that are effective in mental health because in fact it didn't exist. Omega-3s are never associated with other nutrients for a technical problem, which is that they are lipidic in fact and we can't associate them with the nutrient and so either is a new technology that now allows you to combine two capsules in one.
which allows by taking two capsules per day to have the intake of the essential nutrients that I presented to you, in particular omega-3, vitamin D, methyl folate, zinc which for me are priorities. There is the question of iodine, there are also other questions. I haven't addressed magnesium, well there you go, there is I could talk about it for hours. Regarding physical activity, very quickly, we can actually calculate the amount of weekly physical activity with meters, metabolic equivalents because of course, it's not the same thing to do an hour of light walking and one hour of mountain trail running. So in fact, there are metabolic intensities associated with each physical activity that can be found very easily on the internet, on GPT chats. Well there you go, there are lots of ways to find them very easily. And now, we actually know that we have a U-shaped curve that tells us that if we do too little physical activity, we increase our risk of depression. And if we do, then we really have to do a lot because, well, the majority of people, they don't do enough. Finally, it's still very rare that I'm faced with it, but among great athletes for example, it's a subject because there can be malnutrition, a loss of nutrients through sweat, muscular exhaustion, all that. Finally, a vicious circle that can also induce depression, it exists but it is not the most frequent in medical practice. It is really the lack of physical activity. There are more than 60% of French people who do not achieve the physical activity objectives which are now, we know for mental health, it is 25. In fact, when you add up your hours of physical activity, should you do strength training, should you do cardio, should you do endurance or muscle strengthening, how? Currently, there is not, we are not specifically going towards aerobic or anaerobic. They say it's good to do three sessions per week, of about three to four hours, if possible to alternate rather cardio endurance sessions like jogging, cycling and muscle strengthening sessions like a quim, gym, all that uh, to have a complete activity in fact and a healthy body and that it allows to reach the objectives for mental health. In practice, between 20 and 40 meters per week, we consider that we are on target. There, it's not exactly 25, it's not serious, we can be at 22, at 27, between 20 and 40. There, you see that the curve, we have the lowest level of risk of depression compared to physical activity. I'll stop here and we'll take the last question. After this wonderful conference, other continuing medical education petit day should integrate psychonutrition into the three-year orientations of general practitioners. I'm telling you this because, uh, currently it's not there or little b shouldn't include psychonutrition in the three-year guidelines of general practitioners. Be honest. Well, there's the ebook anyway now but anyway. Come on, we can look at the answers. Oh, still, huh? 7% of people are not convinced. Thank you for your attention. Yeah.